Okay, uh, folks, we're going to reconvene. Um, thank you. Thank you for um, staying and uh, for the new arrivals for coming. Um, and thank you to the previous panel for a really tremendous presentation and to all of the uh, panelists uh, for uh, Tanaka-san for coming all the way from Japan, uh, Amanda Vandenduel for, um, for stepping in at the last minute and doing a terrific job, and uh, for Eileen, I guess, for keeping Mike on the straight and narrow. So, um, no, no, seriously, for, um, for all your contributions, that was terrific. Um, so in this uh, panel, we are going to uh, zoom in on the question of Japan's own womenomics uh, challenges and opportunities and policies and uh, look at uh, really what uh, lies behind womenomics uh, in Japan and why it's such an economic imperative. As, as Wendy said, uh, this topic is, uh, has a tendency to, um, to fadism and, and, and this could be something perceived as a fad, but that's not the way I think Japan is looking at it or should look at it because it's really an economic imperative for Japan's future as I tried to describe in, in my opening remarks. Uh, so we're going to look a little bit at that economic uh, imperative and, and at some of the challenges to women's fuller participation in the workforce in Japan and some of the solutions that have been proposed and some, uh, some new ideas that I hope we can put on the table. We have an A-team panel here uh, from uh, your uh, left of me, uh, down the line. Uh, Chad Steinberg, who is at the IMF, he's um, a senior economist and two years ago wrote a really terrific paper on this topic called uh, Can Women Save Japan? And so he's going to present some of the findings which are still uh, relevant. I hope he'll update anything that needs updating. Uh, but Chad will do that first. Uh, then he's, he'll be followed by Ryu Matsukawa, who is the uh, director for gender of the gender mainstreaming division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. Uh, she was also instrumental in organizing the WOW conference, uh, the Women, World Assembly for Women uh, in Tokyo about 10 days ago, uh, which I'm sure she's going to talk about uh, in her uh, remarks. Uh, then next to her, we have uh, our CSIS uh, colleague, um, uh, uh, Miko Oyama, who is the Keidanren representative. Keidanren is uh, Japan's, obviously, um, as most people know, uh, a large uh, big business organization, and uh, she is their representative in Washington, and she also uh, sits at CSIS as a fellow uh, and as a colleague down the hall from, from all of us. So we're delighted to have Oyama-san with us. And then at the very end is um, Robert Feldman, who is Managing Director and Chief Economist for Morgan Stanley MUFG Securities in Tokyo. Uh, Robbie is uh, a well-known fixture uh, to anybody who has been following the Japanese economy for the last, I don't even want to count, uh, but, but I think I got my first briefing on the Japanese economy uh, 22 years ago when I arrived as Assistant Financial Attaché in Tokyo from Robbie. So he's been doing this a long time and he'll be our anchor uh, presenter. So with that, uh, we'll get started. Chad. All right, thank you very much. Um, although I was told not to have a PowerPoint, I have a PowerPoint. Um, it's tough for some IMF economists to go without a PowerPoint, I'm told. Um, okay, so I have three sections. I'll try to keep it under 10 minutes. What I want to do is talk about motivation, um, a little bit on cross-country evidence that we found in our paper, and a little bit more on uh, what are the Japan-specific hurdles, although I'm sure other people on this panel probably know a little bit more than I do on that topic. Okay, so let's start with the motivation. As most people know, Japan is aging faster than anywhere else in the world. And the consequence of this is that you have a labor force that's shrinking very fast compared to other advanced economies. Now you can see that in the left-hand side graph. Now looking at the statistics, basically the working force was about 87 million in the mid-90s, and it's projected to go about 50 million in mid-century. Now, that's about the same size as Japan's workforce at the end of World War II. So it's a dramatic decline, and it's by far Japan's largest drag on growth. So if you think about Japan's potential growth rate around 1% to 2%, depending on how you measure economics, right, this detracts from growth about a quarter percent. So that, that's relatively large. Now, what do you do about it? Um, increasing labor is an obvious answer. Well, how do you increase labor? Um, one way is immigration. Other ways is getting more people that are within Japan to participate more in the working force. Now, if you look at the right-hand side graph, um, we show the difference between um, labor participation rates between females and males. And the gap is quite large for Japan. It's 25 percentage points. 
Japan has a similar structure, I mean, Korea has a similar structure and has a, also a high difference. But if you look at other OECD countries, it's usually between 10 and 15 percentage points, or if you look at the Nordic countries, it's around five. Just to be clear, this yeah. is the gap between men's and women's yeah. participation. So if you look at Japan, it's a, about 25 percentage points That's uh, uh, difference between the number of men working and the number of women right. working. Okay. And, and so this is 2009, so it might be a little different than other, but everybody else's um, statistics. It's also looking at prime age workers, which is basically between 25 and 54. So it detracts from the fact what people do about education and what people do about retirement. Okay, so basically looking at this, I mean, our paper basically is saying that, um, you know, raising LFP or female labor participation seems like an easy win for Japan. Okay, so let's move on to the cross-country evidence. I have two slides on this, um, but what I wanted to show everybody first was how labor participation rates compare across countries, right? So I have two histograms, one from 1985, which is in blue, and one from 2005 in red. And what you can see from this is that within the OECD, these are all OECD countries, so 22 countries, right? The female labor participation rates have been rising across the board, right? But they've also been converging, right? There's a much narrower distribution between the groups. Now, Japan has also risen over that time, but when it used to be right in the middle of the group, now it's near the bottom of the group, right? So what explains is these changes? Um, what we argue using a little bit more sophisticated econometric analysis um, is that a lot of this has to do with demographics. Some of the demographic variables that we look at are education for women. Of course, when women get more educated, the return to work is much higher. We also look at marriage rates and the number of children per worker. So, you know, the pull from home is much less when you get married later or the number of children you have is fewer than you might, you know, the demands from home are less and you're able to participate more in the workforce. So you see that on the right-hand side graph, but all you see really is four lines going directly up. Um, trust me, um, it works out that these tend to explain a lot about the within country variation, meaning if you look at the U.S. over time, right, demographics explain a lot. If you look at Japan over time, demographics explain a lot. But what we also argue in the paper is that it doesn't do as good a job in explaining differences across countries. Now, this is particularly noticeable, I think, in um, this one graph that people like to show is the relationship between the number of children per woman and female labor participation. Now, on the y-axis, you got female labor participation. On the x-axis, you got the number of children per woman. Left-hand side is 1980. Right-hand side is 2008. Now, the 1980 cross-section basically shows that countries show a somewhat negative correlation. And this is what you expect. Um, and, and lots of people say that, you know, if you get more female labor participation, you have less lower fertility rates, and that's bad for de Japan's demographics, right? And so this is a common claim. But if you look, update those data and look at a more recent year, like for example, 2008, it was we have here, the relation terms somewhat positive. And if you look in the bottom right, you mainly have the immigration countries like Australia, USA, New Zealand. And if you take those out, it's even more steep. And if you see the Nordics are in the, in the upper right corner, they seem to do very well in both having high labor participation rates for women and having high fertility rates. So it's not necessarily true in the cross-section right now. Um, so what this possibly highlights is that the importance of demographics diminishes or changes as countries' demographics converge. As all of the advanced economies become more similar in terms of demographics, right, the policy differences matter more. Right? And the corollary to that basically is that the onus for closing gaps between countries may now be on policies. Okay, so now briefly I'll enter into an area where I'm not as much of an expert as my colleagues, but we have a couple of hurdles that we thought were important to, to highlight in our paper. Um, the first challenge that we saw for Japanese women was their limited opportunity to enter career positions, or sogo shoku. Right, so in Japan, for big companies, they have two types of career streams. They have career jobs, which are called sogo shoku, and non-career jobs, which are called ipan shoku. Right, career jobs have a lot of human capital training involved in it. Um, they have clear career paths, right, and also they get paid more. Now, obviously, non-career jobs get paid less. Right, they have less, much less training, and they do much less demanding tasks, and they're not nearly as interesting. But there are many women in that in that section. 
Now, it's hard to get statistics on this, but what I've put up here on the left-hand side is results from a survey from the Ministry of Health, um, Labor, and Welfare. And it's a small sample, but it's telling. Um, and what you see from it on the left-hand side bars is that the share of total career, um, women in career jobs is a mere 6%, right? 6% of people in career jobs is only women, right? Now that's improving over time. So if you look at the middle bars, right? So in 2000, I think 10, right? 12% of women were hired into these jobs. So slowly it's increasing over time because more women are being hired in the current market. But if you think if right now they're only hiring 12% of the career women are in these jobs, the max you can get to is 12%, which by maybe Western standards is a little low, right? So the obvious consequence of that is the right-hand side graph, which shows female managers across um, the OECD, and Japan is 9%. Given that the career share of women in these jobs is only 6%, 9% seems pretty good, but compared to some other countries of 43%, it seems pretty low. Okay, so the second hurdle is because I get to go first, I get to say the most obvious thing and show the chart that everybody always shows. Um, and, you know, it's basically that w women's career is usually, I mean, the, the second hurdle is a women's career is usually the return to work after childbirth. And you can see that in the, this M curve on the left-hand side. Now, at the beginning of a woman's career, in their, you know, early 20s, participation rates are exactly the same across the OECD. Right? But once you hit the late 20s and early 30s, women tend to drop out of the, of the workforce. And you can see there's a dip in this M curve that Japan is coming down. Right? Um, over time, this dip has become less and less, but the dip still exists. And, and the fact is that you know, even today, 60% of Japanese women quit working after giving birth to their first child. Now, why do they do that? One of the reasons is, the reason that I put on the, the slide right before that is that they don't have very fun jobs. Right? Lots of them do not get into the career stream job, so they don't have great prospects for promotion. Right? And so their pull to stay in the workforce is maybe less than men. Right? But the other thing that everybody talks about is it's very hard to balance family responsibilities with work. Um, I'm sure my colleagues are going to say a lot of things about this. Um, so I think I will skip on the, the various measures that you can use. But um, I can tell you a little bit of our empirical results show that you know, there's not one policy that's going to resolve everything. You need a multitude of policies to be able to, you know, help women balance the responsibilities. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, uh, this, all right. the messages of our paper were as follows. One, um, raising female labor participation seems like an easy win for Japan. Um, two, basically the cross-country evidence shows that over time, demographics explains a lot why countries change their labor participation rates for females, but it doesn't explain as well the differences across countries, especially today. And the third point we just wanted to make is Japan needs to an even playing field in the labor market and make it easier for women to balance work and family. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Chad. Really terrific laydown um, of the of the the basic uh, economic story here. And um, I, I was struck by two things. One, that uh, your point about uh, policy mattering relatively more than demographics um, uh, in recent times, and that is going to be a good feed into some discussion of the policy issues at hand. And the second thing that struck me is that we need to do a conference like this on Korea because uh, clearly um, uh, Korea has a similar uh, challenge and maybe a harder one. Uh, so, uh, you san Thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, very nice to meet you, and um, uh, I would like to talk about the, what's Japan's um, their thoughts on the, why Prime Minister Abe and our government is so much into this women's issue first, and then, as you, and then there are also the programs that we are actually tackling on. And then, first of all, the Prime Minister Abe made a sensational speech at the last UN General Assembly. Half of his speech was devoted to women. He committed that um, he will make our society where women shine in Japan and also across the world. And then, well, the recent uh, achievement, his uh, uh, commitment is made at the World Assembly for Women, which was held in Tokyo last, uh, just 10 days ago. And uh, very fortunately, I was in charge of that <laughs> as a secretary. 
and then uh, I can go on forever for the, this wow event, but um, because I have my 10 minutes and <laughs> I'm going spontaneous, I'll try to limit myself just to, to, to uh, uh, touch upon wow that um, it is um, the very first time for Japan to tackling on this issue, this issue to, to, and by holding this, uh, international, this kind of big international symposium and it's not a, just a symposium because um, one, it's new in many ways, but let me, let me point out three. One, it's very comprehensive, it has a very comprehensive agenda, not only focusing on womenomics, but also the other uh, pillar is about the women's empowerment in global issues. So it's really comprehensive. And then it's initiated by top leader. I mean, there are many, uh, Madame Clinton is very keen on the women issue, everybody knows or the um, prime foreign minister, former foreign minister Haig is keen on the PSVI, but um, this time it's really comprehensive and then they're initiated by the top leader, Prime Minister Abe, very consistently. And then, uh, the, secondly, this is symposium are participated by the, the leaders in women's field from all over the world, 100 people gathered. And then, as an individual capacity, it's individual capacity, they talk whole day, but it's just not at the talk. They issued the wow to do um, proposal, a set of 12 proposals that is distributed to you now. And then it includes uh, six devoted to womenomics. And then it's basically directed to Japan. The another six points is directed to the world. So it's about the suggestion to the world. And then that's the second uh, new point, I think. Thirdly, it's not only about the, the great leaders, you know, successful ladies gathered in Tokyo and then talk about the difficult issues, but also, um, 12 out of 40 uh, part foreign participants went to the local side of Japan, and they, they themselves do the individual lectures or like seminars in Fukuoka or Hiroshima or Kurashiki or Tohoku. And so in a way, by doing so, we have a more, how do you say that, um, movement is enlarged, not only in Tokyo, but to the local parts of Japan. And in addition, we had this plan of uh, encouraging the um, individual groups, like uh, NGOs or the business group or the, um, the students' groups to do their own events related to women. It can be seminar, it can be a cinema event, it can be a, their musical event, many ways, that's fine. But do that, let's do it together with WOW. And I was not so sure how many it's coming up, but in the end, uh, we had 120 uh, Shine Week's event coming up. So I think this WOW, together with this Shine Week projects, enlarged our women movement in Japan, enlarged to the local parts. And that's, I think, the another part, uh, another point that is new to WOW. I mean, okay, let me stop here, and then I really thank for the Prime Minister Abe's initiative, plus um, Madame Akie, who is really keen on this uh, WOW, and I think, I'm sure she will talk on the, uh, about touch upon it, so I will stop here. And then let me go to, uh, I only have five minutes. Let me um, go to um, the, the, the major parts. The reason why um, our government is so keen on this women's uh, participate, increasement of women's participation in economy is because uh, not about, not only for women, actually it's not for women. I, I mean, my understanding, it's not only for women, it's for the nation itself. It's a national strategy. It's not even only economy, I would say. Um, the problem is the, the shrinking population, as Chad pointed out, and also the other um, the, uh, lost 15 years of deflation or huge government debts. The Japan model is already not working well. I mean, we have to do something and what we should do. I mean, the past model is like this. The men are going out and they earn money for the whole family while the uh, wives are taking care of kids and they're taking house uh, keeping and then sometimes take care of the elderly. That's the model, but it's based on the, okay, the income is going up and then their, his, the husband's salary is you know, good enough to support whole family and then he can work for the, the same company forever, lifetime uh, employment. And many of these assumptions is already collapsed. So uh, the, the, um, the, we, we uh, the, for example, like a non-regular worker composed one third of the whole uh, labor force in Japan, and then employment is not secure anymore. Their salaries increased and not expected as much, or the pension is not so much counting on because of the aging population. So there are many, many reasons for us to change what we have done in the past 
to a better model. And that's what the key comes into women. And then the, the thing is, uh, the, there is a very you know, promising data by Goldman Sachs or some other you know, index that um, now that only 66% uh, 6 of the college graduate women enter the labor force, and then they quit, as Chad pointed out, 60% quit when they have the first child. But if those women who wish to work but not being able to work because of many reasons, lack of their child care, or maybe the husband is not you know, nice enough, or whatever the reason, <laughs> coming into the labor market, then that actually you know, enhances and um, increases our GDP by 13%, according to Goldman Sachs at maximum. And also, um, some say it's 15, but um, it it's di differs from the, some reports. Anyway, it's quite a big increase. And then also, if this you know, untapped labor resources come into the market, it comes actually in the same level as Sweden, uh, the labor um, uh, participation. And so that is something we cannot dismiss. Presently, Japan is not utilizing these untapped resources in quality or quantity. And then I have to say, Japanese women are very smart. I mean, I don't have to go back to 11th century, but um, Murasaki Shikibu, she was, um, again, I like this example very much. I really want to say this. She is the first female uh, longest novel writer recorded. And then her novel is still very popular and then coming into manga or the Eiga cinema. And then, well, but the, uh, the, the, the and, and then I, I don't need to go only to Japanese. I mean, di diversity is important. And there are many reports that um, diversity actually gives a better decision making, better products. So, I mean, innovation wise, and also the labor force quantity wise, you have to utilize the, um, the women in Japan into the labor. Uh, we don't force them to work, but um, those women, there are many, three, three million women who want to work but because of the, the environment, they are not being able to work. So let's, the, the concept is, let's make policies or the efforts, programs, to uh, release and then utilize these um, potentials to a full, fully, full extent, that's the concept. Okay, let me go into the, the actual policies. Actually, uh, you have better <laughs> materials in front of you because I distributed the Prime Minister Abe's uh, speech uh, made at the WOW conference 12, the day one. And then his speech is really eloquent, touching upon the major policies, but because it's too much for, uh, for me to ask you to read at this moment, so I'll maybe point out the major parts. Um, the, our KPIs, um, I mean, the big our, um, target is to, by 2020, um, women in leading position to 30% and also the employment rates of women to 73%. And then the measures include incentive to women-friendly companies. And the second pillar is supporting women according to life stage, which include um, child, uh, I mean the child care uh, services and enhancement or the outsourcing and encouraging outsourcing by the babysitter or the other uh, reasonable um, child services, care services. And the, Oh, sorry, that's the third. And then the third is change the work style. I mean, the long hour, super long hour working is the biggest hindrance for the Japanese women to continue to work or being promoted. So we change that. That's the three major pillar. And then the uh, wow, if you read the wow to the top number one comes the top leaders, commitment is impo important. And then Prime Minister himself asked the three business uh, groups to appoint at least one female as a board member, and actually it takes effect now that uh, one year ago it was only 6.9% of the board member, but now it's 7.5%. Uh, and also the, his uh, leadership actually led to um, employment of women aged 25 to 44 already improved. Um, 68% in last 2012, going up to 69.5 in 2013. And also, over one year and a half, it's the labor force, a female labor force has increased by 820,000. So which is quite, um, you know, quite a rapid increase. So I think it's the effect is taking place. And then the child care services, we also made efforts and then the 
200,000 children, our care center is already in place. And uh, also we have an already the um, better improvement of child care leave benefits, which uh, is almost equal to Sweden, which means like 80% uh, of the, 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 the coverage of the salary is possible if husband and wife takes both takes the child care leave. So there are many encouragement, or like uh, for the co corporate, but I will skip because I think Oyama-san will touch upon. But uh, government is asking the company to visualize their efforts on their homepage so that the companies uh, who make efforts is actually to be seen by the, the public. Or the procurement also, uh, governments give the, the better tax incentive to the companies who make efforts. Those are the things that um, the government is actually doing. And the, the, uh, I think the, um, it will, I, I think the effect is taking place and the, um, the uh, what to do also mentions about the utilizing the, outsourcing the, the house, housekeeping, um, you know, work to the outside resources and then these things I think we can um, work on more. But I, I'm sure that uh, you will see a new Japan not in a few years, but I think in, in 10 years, you will see still traditional, but maybe more vibrant Japan. Uh, and that will be the answer to uh, the, I think to the US or the developed countries who, which needs to see the new economic growth. We cannot repeat the same thing. It's not possible, but I think the new um, economic growth answer will be the women for Japan. In the case for Japan, it's women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matsukawa-san. Um, and you didn't uh, have time to go through all the, um, the WOW uh, outcomes, but I really would commend you. I think you got the packet. Um, and look at the WOW to-do list, because it really has uh, a very impressive and I think the right list of things that need to be taken on. Um, all of them very difficult, so uh, we'll see how, how well they, they can be implemented, but they are the right list, and it's, a, it's an impressive uh, collection. Uh, Oyama-san. Oh, hi, uh, good morning. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, to say thank you for this opportunity to attend the, to this wonderful seminar. And I'm very happy to share with you uh, all efforts the Japanese corporations are making toward unleashing the power of women uh, in the workforce. So as you know, the women's empowerment uh, has been a long-standing issue in Japan, but uh, now the Japan is facing in the turning point. So looking back at the last few years, the Japanese, uh, the, uh, the number of the women in Japan uh, who are appointed to the outside directors, to the public companies, or the startups, their own business, uh, has increased dramatically, and then now Japan is reaching the uh, reaching up the build the unparalleled momentum uh, in terms of the women's empowerment by uh, Prime Minister and First Lady Abe's uh, strong leadership, as Maskasan said. The, now the Kedanren and the business community also seriously considered and. Uh, considered and recognized that the house important to uh, promoting women's uh, empowerment to to, uh, to for the Japanese uh, business community to succeed in the increasingly the competitiveness global world so the I will give it to the four example is that the currently most of the public companies uh, uh, evaluate women's empowerment to their uh, corporate strategy or uh, point of view from the uh, corporate governance. And some unique analysis uh, shows that uh, the company which is profitable or went to a public is uh, as much as struggling to develop a women's empowerment more than the others. So uh, to this April, the Kedan uh, the published the action plan on the women's uh, active participations in the workforce. As part of the, our the plans, the Japanese companies are encouraged to clear uh, 
state their strong uh, commitment to the promoting the diversity, uh, which includes, of course, uh, enhancing the uh, women's participation in the labor force, and also the, to uh, promote the publish to a concrete action plan based on its own circumstances. By doing so, the, I feel that the company can have a, a significant impact on their corporate culture or uh, uh, the labor the customs from the male-dominated society to a diversified society. So, and to promote this effort, the, this July, the KDAMA also the posted on our website to uh, the voluntary action plan of the 50 major uh, member companies, uh, such as the Toyota, Matole, or Sumitomo and Mitsubishi, uh, and others, at outline policies for uh, promotion of the women's managerial and uh, board positions. So at the same time, we have uh, already requested to the all member companies, which are the over the 1,300 uh, the public companies uh, to draw up and um, the published comprehensive uh, action plans. So our aim is to uh, release uh, those the plans before the, uh, the end of this year. So um, I'd like to uh, point out the three key issues to promote the, the um, women's uh, participations. So first one is the strong, uh, as uh, Matsukasan said, the first one is a strong uh, commitment by uh, CEOs uh, to promote women's participation, so to changing the culture uh, and the customs, the, such as a long working uh, style, and also created a more flexible uh, working environment. And the second one is that uh, we should take more um, cool men who are uh, uh, who put in effort to not only the own business, but also the more the support and enjoy their house works and child care support. So it's like, uh, how to say, um, the, like uh, the audience here, I expect. So, and also uh, the, the, the reason is the society is consists of the both men and women. And also, uh, uh, in Japan, uh, we had a tons of the seminar or a symposium regarding the uh, uh, women's uh, issues. But uh, we, and most of the audience and the panelists are um, mainly the women, it's only women. So the, we should take the cool man to involve the discussion on this issue. And the third point is that uh, uh, we need to take m make more the choice or opportunity for the, the boss uh, for the nations. So n we should not force uh, on all women who uh, must aim to become a president. So in fact, the, there is in uh, in the United States there is a big debate, still big debate uh, between the working mother and housewife. Uh, it's called Mammy's War. So uh, there's a no answer for which is good or not, of course. So we should just provide the opportunity to, and a choice for the nations. So, and there's still many challenges ahead, uh, however, but uh, do you know that this is not, a, Japan is not only country for the working on this issue but also the other nations, including the U.S., also the struggling this issue, such as uh, uh, the glass ceiling problems. So we can share the idea and work together. And also the, the, this, the issue is to really take time. And so the many uh, companies has already announced to uh, women in the leadership positions to uh, 30% by 2020. So, uh, I'm very looking forward to uh, our effort to reach this goal and also working together with the, uh, the United States as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Oyamasan. And I think um, the, the, the key to solving this problem is going to be in the corporate culture. Um, and you've touched on that. And I think that's really the thing I want to follow up with when we get to that opportunity. But thank you very much. Um, Robbie. Thanks very much, Matthew. And thanks for the invitation today. Um, I'd like to start off with a little anecdote uh, that I think gives us a microcosm uh, of uh, what uh, many of the issues are in the Japanese labor market that come together or came together beautifully in one uh, incident a couple weeks ago. Uh, my wife was about to go off on a business trip uh, from Tokyo to Singapore. Uh, she was leaving on the 11 o'clock flight from Haneda uh, to Singapore. We arrived at the airport uh, at 9 o'clock. Uh, she wanted some Singapore dollars. So we go to the bank branch uh, at uh, Haneda Airport. There are four people sitting in the bank branch at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. We are the only customers. Okay? So that's already a problem. Okay, at the bank branch, four people. Two women at the front in the win at the bank windows. Two men in the back sitting at desks. Okay? My wife gives her yen cash to one of the women at the windows. The woman at the window counts it out, calculates how many Singapore dollars to get, prints that out on a white piece of paper, puts the cash in the white piece of paper in a little saucer one of those plastic saucers, hands it to one of the guys in the back. Okay? The guy in the back counts it out again, looks at the white piece of paper, checks the calculation, puts his hunko on it, puts it all back in the saucer, hands it back to her. Okay? She counts it out again, gets the cash out of the drawer, and gives it to my wife. Okay? Who gets paid more, the men or the women? Okay? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll bet you it's the men. Okay? Do we really need four people in that bank branch? <laughs> and the truly ironic part is when we went up to get the boarding pass, my wife puts her passport in the machine and the boarding card comes out automatically. Okay? This is a microcosm of the many issues that face the Japanese labor market. It's a big company. The bank is a very large company. They can't fire the guys in the back of the, uh, of the, of the bank branch because it would cost too much, it would be too uh, unclear legally whether that's okay or not. They're not gonna quit, because if they quit a big bank and go to some other small firm, they would take something like a 75% pay cut relative to what they would get at the other firm. So they're not gonna quit, okay? They are entrapped, okay? And the women at the front, for various reasons, are also entrapped in this situation. So as I go through the economics uh, that I'll talk about now, please keep this little microcosm in mind. It explains, or it at least expresses a lot about what's going on. Okay. One of the key goals of Abenomics is to have a 2% real growth rate. A 2% growth of real GDP. Think from the supply side. You get 2% growth through the growth of the labor force and the growth of productivity. Okay. How do you raise labor force? How do you raise productivity? Both of these have something to do with, with, with uh, womenomics. Okay. Labor force. First, youth unemployment. Japan has made immense strides in reducing youth unemployment. It's actually not so bad, particularly in a global comparison. There's not much left to be done there. There's some, more an education issue, but a, a little bit. The elderly, okay? Uh, as you saw on Chad's graph just, uh, just now, uh, Japanese elderly uh, participation is about the same as it in, in, is in the US, much higher than in Europe. So there might be some we could do. Um, uh, the uh, call it late stage middle age people like me uh, should be encouraged to work longer. Uh, I hope to work until I'm 75. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, that's one of the KPIs that I think uh, Matsukawa-san uh, mentioned. That'll help some. Uh, immigration. We've made a little bit of progress on that so far. Particularly, I think Prime Minister Abe was very forceful in saying, in, at least in the economic zones, we're going to have household help come in to help women's participation rate. But also, finally, raise participation rates. Let's talk a couple numbers on participation rates. Okay? Uh, 60 years ago, uh, the male participation rate, that is the ratio of males in the labor force to total men over 15, was about 87% in Japan. Okay. Today, it's about 70. Is this because men have gotten lazy? No. It's because men have gotten older. If you look at the age profile of male participation rates, they're about the same as they were 60 years ago. Much higher, by the way, in the United States. Okay. So the participation profile hasn't changed very much, but men have moved into the older 
age groups, and so the overall participation rate has come down quite significantly. Okay? What about female participation rates? In the early 1950s, female participation in Japan was about 57, 58 percent. By 1970, it had fallen to about 45. That was basically a move from farm to factory. After the early 1970s, it went back up to about 50, and it's been bumping around 50 for the last 30, 40 years. Okay? Now, this is an interesting conundrum. If the male participation rate has fallen because men are getting older, is the female participation rate flat because women are not getting older? <laughs> no, that's not what's happening. What's happening is across the curve, uh, 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 Chad showed an interesting, the, the M curve there. If you look at the shape of that M curve over the last you know, 30, 40 years, it has shifted upward very, very substantially. For example, women in their late 20s, the 20, uh, 25 to 29, in 1988, the participation rate for the late 20s women was 58%, now it's 78%. This has happened across the board. So basically, higher participation for, for women has offset the impact of aging so far. Okay? This gets us to a very interesting question of whether that can continue. I did a little calculation in a, in a piece I did uh, a while back. Let me give you some numbers here, and if I may, uh, uh, put everybody on the spot and ask a, a couple quick little questions, too. Okay, let me see if I can find my, my page. Here we are, okay. Um, let's start with the, the uh, female labor force participation rate in 2013 and the, and the age profile curve, okay? Um, if you take the age profile curve of 2013, the age participation profile, multiply it for each age group by the population in 2020, we pretty much know what the population in 2020 is going to be like. Okay? So take the female population structure of 2020, multiply it by those participation rates today, what happens to the total number of women working or in the labor force? The answer is it declines by about 1.7 million. That's a lot of aging. Okay? So that's if you use today's age wage profile. If you used the U.S age wage profile from today, what would happen to the female labor force in Japan? Who says up? Who says down? Ups? Downs. Okay? The answer is down. Okay? Quite substantially. Okay? But instead of falling 1.7 million, it only falls 1.2 million. <laughs> so the impact of that increased labor force participation is helpful, but it doesn't offset the aging. Okay? Furthermore, one other major difference between U.S. and Japan and the labor force participation. Here's the second question. Of that saving, okay, uh, of uh, drop of the labor force, okay, of about, uh, so, um, um, of the 1.1 million, okay, how much is accounted for by higher um, participation of women under age 20? The answer is about half, okay? So, of the, the savings, about half is accounted by very young women. I want those young folks to stay in school. They should be studying science, they should be studying math, they should be studying business, accounting, whatever. I want them to stay in school, okay? So the fact that Japanese female participation rates are lower than in the U United States also reflects the fact that the U.S. is not educating its young people quite as well. So let's be a little bit careful on or what we wish for, okay? So that's the, the participa participation side. Um, there's a lot to be done on participation, but it's by no means a panacea for the overall labor force problem. Next, productivity. Where does womenomics fit into productivity? I think there are a number of places. First of all, if you look at a correlation between what really causes productivity growth, and that's got to be the whole thing. Uh, say Chad's number of uh, 0.5, what it was, uh, of decline from the labor force participation. Um, say that uh, is offset by better labor force participation. In order to hit that 2% growth rate, we still need 2% productivity growth, right? For the last 20 years, it's been one. What is the best way to raise productivity growth? It's R&D, okay? Education helps too. It's a little harder to figure it out, but I think one of the key things uh, in uh, improving uh, the uh, labor force participation and the con contrib contribution that women make is to work on education and women's position in R&D, okay? 
keep folks in school, get them trained in math and science in particular. In addition, allocation. It goes back to my airport example. There's a big difference between wages between large and small companies, 75%. So the average compensation for small com or medium-sized companies, not tiny ones, medium-sized companies is about 4 million yen a year. The average compensation for large companies is about 7 million yen a year. Are people who work at large companies that much more productive than people who work at small ones? Probably not. Yeah, there's more capital at the big companies, so there's some reason for that. But it's not that, I doubt it's that much. Okay, so that big small gap has gotta be overcome, okay? That's the two guys working in the back of the, back of the bank branch, okay? Um, there's a lot of differentials by region. Uh, there's a lot of uh, differentials by duration as well, how long you've worked, uh, but also, of course, by gender, okay? Now, how do we solve this gender issue along with the others? I think we have to reestablish this principle of equal pay for equal work, okay? Uh, we also have to uh, work, I think, very hard, uh, particularly hard on the glass ceiling issues. And we've seen some things already begin to happen on that. Okay? These are productivity issues. That bank branch of mine that we went to, that could probably operate with one person. There are a few folks around who still like to change cash, but one person is probably enough. And so that is uh, an issue of uh, getting the right people in the right place, paying them properly. Uh, what are the policies that I think are necessary to get this done? There are two things I would emphasize. Uh, one is a major expansion of one of the key improvements we've already seen in economics, and that's the white collar exemption. People complain about how long Japanese stay at the office and this kind of stuff. Well, you know, the way the, the labor laws have worked so, so far, they encourage people to stay at the office. Heretofore, the white collar exemption, that is to say the number of people exempt from the overtime rules, has been about less than 1%. Um, the labor laws say that if you stay more than X hours per week, they have to pay you overtime. Of course, the, the workers know that, and so they stick around. This is perfectly common. Everybody knows it's a scam, but everybody does it because that's the way the rules work. Okay? If we could expand the uh, white collar exemption quite significantly, maybe to say 20 or 25 percent of the labor force, as it is in the U.S., this hours issue would be, I think, largely solved. Okay? which would have immense impact on the, uh, on the labor force use. Secondly, uh, and this is under discussion now, we'll see what happens, is something called monetary compensation for dismissal. Okay? Let me give you an example. If Morgan Stanley fires me today, and I think that's unfair, I can go to court, and I can say, look, that was unfair, blah, blah, blah reinstate me, okay? or whatever. It'll take a couple years for that to wind itself, wind its way through court, if the court rules in my favor, Morgan Stanley would have no re legal recourse other than to rehire me and pay me back wages. Okay? Which means they're going to be very reluctant to hire full-time workers because what if business conditions change? Okay? So if we can have monetary compensation for dismissal, okay, that's going to make it much more flexible for firms to hire and fire as needs arise. Okay? It'll also give important incentives to workers to raise their skill levels. The two guys at the back of that bank branch, they're sitting there entrapped because the bank is not empowered to give them a couple years wages and say goodbye. And because the bank is not empowered to do that, they are not acquiring the skills they need to go on to the next stage of their careers. And by the way, they're limiting the opportunities for advancement for the two women sitting in the front of that bank branch too. So I think one of the key things in pushing forward, or let me put these two things, key things in pushing forward uh, the womenomics agenda is to get to work on this white collar exemption, make it bigger, uh, and to, uh, to actually implement this monetary compensation for dismissal. Let me uh, end with a couple other things. Some of these policies are gonna cost money. Where's that money gonna come from? Well, Japan today spends uh, about, uh, what was it, 15 trillion on R&D, public and private put together, public is about five trillion, okay? Japan spends about five trillion on defense. Japan also spends 125 trillion yen every year on social welfare programs. 60 trillion for pensions plus, 40 trillion on medical, 10 plus trillion each on nursing and family support, okay? How are we going to raise education levels, 
uh, improve labor markets, get some of these issues with uh, the, uh, the um, uh, health uh, care support uh, for the elderly or, or for women who, who, and, and uh, get them household helpers. How are we going to get that, those issues addressed if we're spending that much money on these social welfares? We need to raise the retirement age. So keep people in the labor force. That'll help, even on the expenditure side. We need to eliminate waste in the medical system. A friend of mine, uh, doc, a, a pharmacologist, I asked him, okay, if you had to give me a number on how much we could cut out of that 40 trillion on medical spending without sacrificing quality, what percentage would that be? He said, a third. We could take 15 plus trillion out of the medical budget every year without sacrificing quality if we could just make it work more efficiently. And that's not hard to do. A third of the medical care is now spent on uh, terminal, uh, terminal care for the elderly. I get very angry about this uh, for, due to experiences in my family. My view is that the way we're running our medical systems now is deeply immoral because we are unnecessarily and in a certain sense in a torturing way extending life unnecessarily Japanese public opinion polls say a very queer, uh, very queer preference not to have life extension medical policies or medical care, okay? We have to cut that out. Stop torturing old people <laughs> and use the money for socially beneficial purposes, like educating kids, uh, use things for, to support women in their work in, in the labor force. So we gotta find the money self somewhere. Uh, I'm uh, very much in favor of this education. Uh, I've been working actually with Kathy Matsui as well on this UAW, as I think Madam uh, Abe is also working. Um, this is something that's very, very near and dear to my heart. Because um, the, the more we push education uh, and opportunity for women, the better the society is going to be overall. There's an institution uh, that we've all been involved with called the Asian University for Women. Uh, my involvement was uh, actually triggered, inspired, uh, by a woman uh, from uh, Washington years ago, she's passed away now, but a woman named Eleanor Hadley, uh, who was uh, an economist in the occupation period, uh, and was very instrumental in rebuilding uh, the Japanese economy and preventing some of the more, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, anti-redevelopment New Dealers from uh, basically destroying things. She was very, very influential. And for that reason, uh, for dealing with Eleanor over the years, who was a wonderful, wonderful, and very forceful person, um, those are the reason, that was the reason I got involved with AUW. Uh, and I think uh, if we push that agenda more, the science technology agenda, the education agenda, using money that we're currently wasting in the social security systems, then we can push the womenomics agenda even more strongly. Uh, so let me end my short little tirade there, and we'll go on. Th thank you. <laughs> thank you, Robbie. Um, as always, um, really insightful and, and, um, and comprehensive, and I think particularly you've you've focused the conversation on a few of the, the key policy areas that I think uh, are really important here. And, and some of those, in fact, I think the first ones you mentioned, the, the ones about the white collar exemption and the um, monetary compensation for dismissal are things that are, uh, get to the broader question of, of flexibility of the labor force and, and don't just apply to women, but they are preconditions or dealing with issues like that. Uh, through concrete policies actually can make a difference to the overall labor conditions that would, would improve uh, conditions for women as well. So I'm glad you introduced and emphasized those, uh, those points. Okay, I was going to ask a couple of questions of the panelists, but because we're running a little behind, I'm going to forgo that right and, uh, and move straight to questions. Um, so if you have a question for any or all of the panelists, please raise your hand. There are microphones coming around. Please identify yourself and, and ask a short question if you can. There's a lady in the back there. Yep. Hi, Nina Easton with Fortune Magazine. Can all of you, um, or whoever wants to, address the question of culture, uh, the desire among women to stay home, uh, and the and the culture that men have bought into too? It seems like uh, you know I was in. Uh, lived in Japan in 1993, writing about this, and what you wrote, Matthew, in your um, newsletter today, uh, it, it's exactly the same, it seems like. It doesn't seem like a lot changed. So just two questions. One, how much of a role does culture play, and how much has it changed? Okay, I don't know whether, you know, Oyama-san and uh, uh, Matsukawa-san, more because you're Japanese than because you're women, I'd be interested in your, your answer to that question. 
Can I then uh, thank you for the question? And uh, actually, I think the culture has changed a, quite a lot, especially for the younger generations. And maybe Oyama-san may have a different view. But I, I think the uh, if also the data shows the tendency is uh, the younger generation has more acceptance for the men and women sharing the housekeeping or the raising kids. So like my husband, who is in their 40s late, they don't change. He, when I ask to wash dishes, he just wash the dishes, meaning he skipped the cup or skipped the, the <laughs> spoon or fork. <laughs> I think it was his put it resistance. But um, well, he doesn't change. Write that I get really that. But the younger yeah. generations, they are more naturally engaging in the sharing work and the, or for the household and raising kids both. So I think it's already changing. I don't worry that part too much. But on the other hand, there are, because of the, I think, financial difficulties, I, some younger women hope to be a housewife um, because it's a lucky strike. I mean, you cannot be a housewife and being happy unless you catch a rich, promising husband, which is much more difficult than having a great job. So I think that's one thing. <laughs> And then, uh, just just for um, because uh, it's related to um, the Robert's um, points, on I, I need to <coughs> just supplement one two things very quickly. Actually, Prime Minister, I mean, our government is actually working on the white collar exemptions enlargement, and the government and the labor and the business, um, in business, um, the CEO parts. Uh, three three um, di three parts dialogue is actually ongoing. So we are that taking that issue already under, I mean, as an issue and then working on. The other thing is retirement age. Our government is trying to um, upgrade it to 70 years old. And then the, for the, the long hour, super long hour, low productivity work style is the biggest problem. And then the, uh, pr our program also includes the, um, the flexible work style of like t introducing telework or the, the ICTs more, in, and then the, also the flex time and all this flexibility of the work style is the, the biggest pillar. I quit that, I was a little bit nervous and I quit that point because too, too much constraint on the time, but I just wanted to mention that that is a very important point and our program is actually tackling on that. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Go ahead. So I totally agree with the, the idea with uh, the Mats Kawasan the idea so and the, my understanding is also that the, the younger generation the under the maybe 40 so the, that the generation is much more dr dramatically uh, change the the uh, the share the house work between the, the men and the, the uh, women so and the, the younger uh, the, the man it's very respect to a uh, women to the outside to work, the, so and that, that's why they are support the uh, very much. So and also the the corporate side, the many uh, Japanese companies has already tried to uh, make uh, the nursery own nursery uh, equipment and also the the child care support uh, systems and policies. At the same time, but uh, I, uh, we need to uh, implement or make a policy is, is that the uh, element of the tax system, including tax uh, deductions and uh, exemption for the support, uh, support and the aspect of the national pension scheme were designed by uh, the very traditional family model uh, that was based on the gender role uh, stereotype. So, mm, as you point out, now the social and economic environment has been uh, changed, so we need to adapt to the eliminate the gender role uh, stereotypes. Okay, thank you, Oyama-san, and, and thanks for introducing the tax issues, which are another thing on the WOW to-do list uh, and important uh, points. You know, the marriage penalty, the um, the um, tax, you know, the idea of introducing better tax deductions for child rearing tax incentives for companies and encourage men to take parental leave. So there are a bunch of tax issues. Robbie, did you want to comment on that or? Yeah, if I may. Um, one thing is that culture is endogenous. When you change the economic incentives, the culture has changed too. Um, uh, there was a, a study by a, a Nihon University professor a few years ago and he asked uh, a raft of women, this is on a you know, standard uh, a sample, big sample from the Ministry of Welfare. Um, do you want to uh, get married and have kids? And then he tried to regress the answers, the yes-no answers to that, on a bunch of other questions that he asked. Okay? 
uh, 40 some other questions. There were only two that were statistically significant. One was age, and the other one was the, the yes no answer to a question. Uh, when you were a teenager, did your father help with the housework? And if the answer was yes, then the women wanted to get married and have kids, and if the answer was no, then they didn't. Okay? So as culture changes, we're going to see some changes there. If I may add one other uh, policy change I think is necessary. Uh, you mentioned the three-party dialogue uh, right now. Uh, my view is that the three-party dialogue between uh, 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 labor, business, and government is actually a dialogue between big labor, big business, and big government, and it's baloney. It's not going to have any impact on labor market change. Okay? Because basically what you've got around the table is a whole bunch of guys who are the vested interests. The guys at that table are the guys sitting in the back of that bank branch. Okay? And they are not going to give up what they want unless we get other people at the table. So my proposal is to um, abolish uh, the Rodo uh, Sesak Shingikai, that is the, uh, the Labor um, Policy Affairs uh, Commission at the Ministry of Health and Welfare. Okay? and substitute for that commission uh, a group that is more representative of the labor market. Today there are 30 people on the committee. The, uh, 10 of them are academics from Tokyo, some of whom have, shall we say, a, uh, only a, a modest grasp of what's really going on. 10 of them are labor union officials. Labor unions represent 18% of the labor force now. Okay? And the other 10 are big business representatives. This is not a labor policy council that's going to give us the kind of changes we need. So my uh, advice to Mr. Shiozaki, if he were to ask me, which he hasn't, but my advice would be fire the whole commission. <laughs> fire them all and replace them. Monetary compensation. <laughs> uh, without, okay, maybe give them a few bucks, whatever. Um, and replace them with a, a group that better represents the labor market as it is now. That's my third policy recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Robbie. Is this side of the room, uh, you're somebody over here, but I'm looking in this direction. Okay. You missed your chance. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, my name's David Walker. I'm with uh, the Marine Corps in Kayakal, uh, out of Quantico. Uh, I'm curious about the, about the women who do not get married. Uh, what their outcomes look like in the labor market compared with the women who do, mm -hmm. since they don't have some of the same pressing issues of women who do get married and then have children. Does anybody have any statistically significant answer to that? He, well, you want elaboration? You mean, uh, you're asking about the workforce um, um, participation rates of unmarried women and how... Specifically, I'm aware, although I don't mm -hmm. know the statistics offhand, but I'm aware that the number of Japanese women who aren't married is mm -hmm. increasing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what their labor force participation rate looks like, the opportunities that are available to them, what that looks like. And in other words, if we were to use them as a, as a, as a group to analyze uh, counter to the sort of mm -hmm. standard Have you looked at that at all, Joe? No, not something you've looked at. Have you? I have some sense, but I don't have that. I don't think we. I don't think we have a statistical answer to that question, but maybe Matsukawa-san has a yeah. uh, an impression on this. I, I don't have a statistic data, so this is just my impression. I may be wrong, but my sense is there are two different groups of the women who are unmarried. There are unmarried women. They are into the, the you know the career paths and they aiming at the promotion and then so very you know high participation in the, the market and then also the leadership position pursuing. The other part, the, the other type of the group of the women who are actually um, taking unregular work, so they are not earning big money. I mean actually uh, low paid and then they don't they are seeking for their good marriage but not necessarily because, and then they are often not very much highly educated so these kind of the typical type of women they are participating labor market or sometimes just stay at house with their parents and then so you know you cannot just say unmarried women is this type or that type i have i have i, I know very different two types the same way goes to the um, the regular uh, employment women's group you see I have two kids. I'm working crazily, 
and I, I'm, I, I'm committed after this UN General Assembly season, I will do as WOW's commitment says, unprecedented drastic change of work style to, be, to come home at 6.15. But having said that, there, I have a regular work, two kids, and then I'm working full time and, you know. And then the other type is, well, you actually are working, but just to supplement, the, the, your priority is kids. And then not necessarily, um, you know, work, work maybe sometimes short hour. Like our, so it's, it's, you cannot just say, by, my, my, so my answer to you is, there may be some statistical tendency, but you cannot just uh, make a statistic by two very different groups, only by the number. My, my sense is, there are two very different groups in both uh, unmarried women and married women. Thank you. Okay, Robbie, quickly, and then we're gonna let one more question back there. Okay, thanks, I don't have data on this, but I can give you the example of uh, my wife's cousin, Satsuki. Okay, uh, she was hired as an ipanchoku, uh, sort of general uh, a person, uh, at a, uh, a large uh, life company uh, about 15 years ago. She's worked the whole time. She's happy in her you know current single job. Uh, she's a single woman, happy in the job, wants to keep doing this, not particularly interested in you know looking out for her husband. Then her company came along and said, "Gee, uh, you know we're kind of short on uh, professional track folks. So would you consider shifting?" from uh, uh, general track to professional track, okay? Now that requires a certain number, of, she's never thought of doing that, and for these 15 years in the firm, she never had any incentives to acquire the skills necessary to be on the, uh, the professional track. And now all of a sudden they're asking her to switch, okay? So it'll be very interesting, well she, did, she agreed to do it, um, we'll see if they transfer her to New York or something like that, but now she's got a completely different set of responsibilities uh, so you might call that a reward for having stuck with it. Um, we'll have to have to see. I wish I had some statistics on it. But it's it very beyond, interesting. Beyond example. that anecdote, do you have an impression that that mm -hmm. sort of thing is happening more? Yes, very so. clearly happening. There's a labor shortage. Go to any labor-intensive uh, company in Tokyo. The big companies, the listed companies, they still have excess labor, like our friends in the bank. The small companies don't. They need all the talent they can get. And if you look at the quantity of employment and the wages that women are getting, quantity and wages have been rising for the last 20 years. For men, quantity and wages have been falling. There is a convergence. Uh, the ratio of, male to, of female to male wages per hour uh, is now about 66%. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, it was about in the mid-50s. So that convergence is occurring. And you know, people like my cousin, my wife's cousin are uh, you know, examples of how that's happening. Okay, thanks. Abigail? Thank you, Abigail Friedman of the Asia Foundation. Um, this has been fascinating, both uh, sets of panels. Um, this last panel in particular, uh, what I find most interesting is that you have linked the conversation to Prime Minister Abe's third arrow. Um, and uh, let's see if I can phrase this correctly, but there are two um, strong interests in uh, addressing the uh, gender inequality issues in Japan. One is uh, because it's the right thing to do, and then the other is for economic uh, reasons. Um, I have been to various CSIS organized panels as well on the issue of the three arrows, and when they get to the structural reform one, the jury is still out. My guess is that in Japan, if you ask if you took a poll and asked people how they feel about women in the workforce, you're going to get much higher support for that than if you ask people about structural reform. So my question is, how do we save the, um, the issue of uh, uh, gender equality and advancing the role of women in Japanese society in the face of um, uh, controversy, ambivalence over uh, structural reform and the there are people who feel that structural reform in fact is not essential to address Japanese economic issues so um, if you can turn that into a question that uh, can help me understand the nexus between the third arrow and uh, women's empowerment in Japan, I would appreciate it. Thank you. I guess, I guess there are two parts that I hear in there. One is what is the actual impact of womenomics in the third arrow debate and, and does it weigh very heavily relative to some of the other structural forms? You didn't exactly ask that, but that's what I'm asking. And then the other is, um, 
is, you know, it's hard. So, so is, it, is, it, is it harder or less hard than other structural forms? Is it more or less likely to actually be done once the conferences are finished and the speeches have been given? You know, are people actually going to follow through on some of this difficult work? I don't know if anybody... Robbie. My Maybe view we'll... is that the third arrow is a lot more popular than uh, the Japanese media would have you think. Because remember, the, the Japanese media are part of the old structure. Okay? So they don't like a lot of this stuff. Because what if, for example, uh, there was a proposal to uh, abolish the, uh, the newspaper law, the shimbun ho? Okay? You can bet dollars to donuts that the Nikkei and the Yomiuri will oppose that because that's how they maintain their control over the media. Okay? So the, the fact that some sources like that are against uh, elements in the third arrow uh, doesn't convince me that the country is against it. What's my evidence? Uh, the evidence comes from when Prime Minister Abe decided to enter the TPP negotiations. Okay? There was a lot of controversy about whether he should do that before the election last year. He said, we're going in. And his support rate went up. Okay? Uh, many years ago, uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Koizumi called the election on postal savings reform, big structural reform. He won by a landslide, okay? So my sense is that the folks who are against the structural reforms are loud, but they're small. Another thing in agriculture, uh, the Prime Minister just uh, announced a few weeks ago that there would be a major change in the laws on the Japan Agricultural Association. Okay, yeah, everybody knows we gotta do that. There's not nearly as much opposition as, as uh, some of the, the louder uh, louder folks would say. The key uh, to me in getting that done is this diet reform, the lower house diet reform, but we don't have time to go into that today. So. In, fact, in fact, unfortunately, because I want to hear other answers, I think we're going to have to take some of that offline, and maybe Abigail, you can uh, talk to some of the other panelists afterwards, because it's an interesting question. We are over time, unfortunately, so I am going to have to end this panel uh, now, but please join me in thanking the panelists for an excellent <laughs> presentation. We, we now have nine minutes and 45 seconds to eat lunch. Um, it's, it's up on the uh, Sam Nunn Terrace behind us. Uh, please get your lunch. You can bring it back in here. And as you come back in, uh, there are um, headsets and um, interpreting 